Yes, Mr. Stewart. Your Honour, the next witness is Mr. Joe Bello. His statement should be behind tab 9 in the statements folder. Well, it's necessary for you to be sworn. Can you take a note on the Bible or an affirmation? Um, whichever, I don't know. Well, it's a matter for you. Sorry? Yeah, that's fine. What's fine? At the Bible. The Bible. Would you take the Bible in your hand, please? And repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission. That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Yes, thank you. Take a seat, please. Yes, Mr. Stewart. Thank you. Bello, will you state your full name? Uh, Joseph Bellow. Do you have before you a copy of your statement dated 10 July 2015? Yes, I do. Are there any amendments or corrections you wish to make to the statement? Uh, not that I know of. It's, as long as it says I've submitted it, that's fine. Yeah. You... Bello, I wonder if you could come close to the microphone, but Sorry. also could you speak a bit louder because that microphone is the resource for a lot of people who aren't actually in this room who may wish to listen to you. Right? Certainly. Maybe yes. just lift it up, twist it up a bit too. That might help. Yes, Mr Stewart. Do you confirm that your statement is true and correct, Mr Bella? Yes. Attend to the statement. It will become Exhibit 29-5. Mr. Bello, you were baptised as a Jehovah's Witness in 1973, is that right? Yes. And you were anointed as an, uh, sorry, appointed as an elder in 1991? Yes. And since then you have served in that capacity in the Kingsley congregation? Yes. And how big is that congregation? Uh, about 90 publishers or so at the moment. In paragraph two of your statement, and perhaps we can scroll down, uh, you deal with the subject of reporting uh, or, or how elders respond to complaints of child sexual abuse. And you'll see what you say at the foot of that page and then over the next page. And you say there that you report immediately to the branch office, which then advises of any requirements of mandatory disclosure to relevant authorities. Is that right? Yes. And if you are not advised by the branch office to report to a secular authority, such as the police, then I take it you don't do so? I wouldn't unless somebody brought to my attention that there was some legal requirement. Yeah. So if there's a legal requirement to report and that is brought to your attention, you'll report? If there's a legal requirement, we always try to do what the law says, definitely. And if there's not a legal requirement, then you don't report? Not unless we were advised to do so. And by advised to do so, you mean advised by the branch? Yes. So are there no circumstances then in which you would report a matter to the police if you hadn't been advanced, advised by the branch to do so? Look, I don't know what situation would come up and how it would come up. If I had a question about it, I'd ask the branch. Now, if we look at 2.2, um, uh, the matter is then handled internally, is it, by if a complaint is made that is of child sexual abuse um, in the manner you set out in 2.2. In other words, two elders are directed to investigate the complaint if substantiated a judicial committee of three elders is appointed and so on. And then also in 2.4, where a person has been found guilty of child sexual abuse, that's guilty by the judicial committee, is it? That you're referring to? Uh, yes. 
the elders privately counsel him as to appropriate behavior with children, such as not spending time with them without any adult present, not inviting them to his home, not engaging in displays of uh, affection, uh, and so on. Now, could we go to 4.1? see there you say that the case involving BCD is the only one concerning child sexual abuse in which I have been involved. Yes. So, since you wrote the statement, have you thought of any others you, you've been involved in, Mr. Bella? No. Our records uh, suggest that there are two others that you were involved in. You're going to be shown their names. The idea is that you don't read the names out, and nor will I. It's to be an aid to your memory. When you see those names to those does that help you remember two other cases? Uh, one name here I recall as something that happened before the Kingsley congregation was formed, or I was part of it. I don't even know the person. The other case was a situation of someone who hadn't been attending for a long, long time, and it was handled by the police, and I had no involvement. So... Dealing with the first case, which I understand you to say was before the Kingsley congregation was formed, uh, but was that a case of child sexual abuse? From what I've been told, yes, I don't know anything much about it. Yeah. So, and you didn't have any involvement in it at no, all, you say? None at all. Right, and the, the second case was someone who had been in the congregation but had been uh, away from the congregation for some time, is yes, that right? Yes, that's right. And, and, and events happen, and I heard about them after they'd been dealt with by the police and everything. So I wasn't involved at all. Events happened outside of the congregation. Hmm. In the case of um, uh, BCB, in your paragraph 5, which is on the screen, we can just scroll down to the substantive part of the paragraph, further down, the next page, 5.1, you say sometime in 2012, but you can't remember the exact date, BCB asked the elders to visit her to to discuss an issue, and uh, you say you and David Wood visited her and her husband um, at her home, uh, and then you carry on in that paragraph to set out your involvement. Now, you then reported that involvement to the branch office, is that right? I didn't do it personally. Uh, Brother David Wood and another elder found the branch. And what was reported to you as to what the response was from the branch? I can't remember exactly, but the gist of it was to provide whatever help we can to get whatever information BCB can provide us and to provide that to the branch. Now, can I show you tab 71? Do you recognise this letter, um, Mr. Bello? It's yes, I do. 18 December 2012, and it's from you to the service desk. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain the circumstances in which this letter came about? Were you writing to the service desk about BCB's case in 2012? Uh, when we went to see BCB, she provided us with details of what had happened. And then after contacting the branch, we... 
ask the ECB if she would be happy to put that into uh, some written form that we could send to the branch. And after a couple of weeks, she provided that to us and we wrote a covering letter, this covering letter, and sent that along with what was provided to us to the branch. And by that time, uh, Mr Neal had been deceased for quite some time. I really don't know when he died. I don't know. I believe he had died already, but I don't know. At the time that you wrote the letter, did you, did you know that he had died? I really can't remember if BCB was able to tell us what had happened or not. I could be, but I can't remember. And what was the purpose, in your understanding, of making a re this report to the branch about these events that had occurred many years before? Well, we did it on the um, wording that BCB gave us, which is she wanted to make sure the branch had these details in case someone else had had similar experiences with the same brother. Did you have any expectation as to what the branch might do with this information? Uh, no, I didn't know. I presume that they would have other details from when it was handled and that would help them to work things out. So they may be able to match the information with yes. some other information they already have. Mm -hmm. And then if we look at the next tab, 72, um, two years later, December 2014, uh, you had cause to write again to the branch. Do you recognise this letter? Um, Perhaps we can scroll down for you. I don't remember writing that letter, but I probably read it and signed it. Well, you, if you look at the end of the second page, you'll see that you're quite right uh, in that regard. So who wrote this letter, do you remember? Uh, this would have been written by David Wood and Robert Boardman. What makes you conclude that? Because I know that they were handling the matter after I uh, wasn't involved in it anymore. Well, you, you've, your name is here and you've signed the, the letter. In what sense were you not involved in it anymore? I wasn't actively trying to help BCB or give support at that time. Now, you'll see on the first page of the letter, if we can go back to the paragraph number two, you'll see there it's recorded that the alleged perpetrator is Brother Neil, now deceased. So at the time you wrote that letter, you of course knew that he was deceased. Yes, at that time. And what was your understanding of the writing of that letter? My understanding... Sorry, as to its purpose. Yes. My understanding was that we had further details provided by BCB and from recollection there were a lot more details in terms of names, dates, things like that. So it was providing further information as it became available. If we go over the page to uh, paragraph 6, You'll see it says in about July 2014, Brother Bello paid a friendly visit to both BCC and BCB at their home. And it was only at this time that BCB made mention that she was considering reporting the matter to the Royal Commission on child abuse and seeking compensation. So, firstly, you were, of course, involved in this matter by visiting BCB and her husband and discussing the matter, not so. Yes. And perhaps you can tell us just what occurred in relation to the possibility of the matter being reported to the Royal Commission? Well, that matter came up earlier when 
basically be his husband and I were out in the ministry and then afterwards when we went back to the car, we sat in the car and we were having an informal conversation about uh, how BCB was feeling and coping, etc. And her husband said that they were thinking of taking the matter to the Royal Commission. And I made, I asked a question, I said, but what would that accomplish? Sorry, my mouth is dry. Other than dragging Jehovah's name through the mud. So I guess it might be a reference to that. And then um, BCB's husband told me what he felt would be accomplished. He said a measure of closure and also maybe financial compensation. And I said I could see that point about the closure. I also asked, um, I didn't know that the Royal Commission was about financial compensation. And he said, yes, we've looked into it. And that was it. So you'll understand how in you asking the question, what would that achieve other than uh, dragging the name of Jehovah through the mud, that would be understood as a discouragement to go to the Royal Commission? It might be understood that way, but that's not how it's meant. It was an informal conversation. I asked the question, what would it accomplish? Yes, I was thinking out aloud, and thinking back on it, I should have said the rest of the sentence. And I take it within your uh, faith, Jehovah is considered as a loving God. It's definitely. And would Jehovah then not also not be more concerned about the victim than his own name? Uh, Jehovah would be concerned about the victim, but Jehovah is concerned about his own name too. That's what the scriptures tell us. Well, would his name not withstand public knowledge of dreadful things wrongly done by someone professing to follow him? I don't think that that was my point. My point was simply to ask the question, what will be accomplished? And yes, there was some thinking aloud, and that's all. Can you understand how, by putting that question in that way, it contributes towards feelings of guilt that BCB has in bringing this matter to the Royal Commission? I was talking to her husband, and looking back, I probably would have worded that different. But at the time, that's how it came out. Can we look at your statement at 5.13, paragraph 5.13? That's where you explain what you've, you've just done. You explain that, that the statement as you've explained it now in uh, the witness box, and you say in the last sentence, uh, well, let me start before that, you say, I was wrong to say it. In other words, say, ask that question about dragging Jehovah's name through the mud, and, it, uh, and I never would want to discourage someone going to the authorities with a complaint of child sexual abuse. And this is also against the direction we receive as elders from the branch. I take it that the direction you're referring to is that um, if people want to report to the authorities, they should not be discouraged from doing so. That's right. You don't mean to say that there's a direction from the branch to positively encourage people to go to the authorities. Uh, I just mean whatever the letter says. I can't remember the exact wording, but whatever the letter says. Well... We're looking now at your statement, not at the letter. Yes. And your statement says, this goes against the direction we receive as elders from the branch. Now, I'm just seeking to understand what it is that you're saying there. You've agreed that it's a reference to a direction not to discourage people from taking reports or reporting to the police, right? That is the direction. And I'm seeking to understand it's not, you're not saying there's any direction to positively encourage people to go to the authorities. I don't believe the letter says that, so I'm not saying that. Not I'm saying whatever the letter says. We're not talking about a letter, we're talking about your evidence. Mm. There's, there's no direction to your knowledge to positively encourage uh, people complaining of sexual abuse to go to the authorities. Is that right? The direction is 
to encourage them to do whatever they feel is best, whether that be to report it or not report it, apart from whatever legal requirements there are, which of course we would follow. Do you know of any case where a victim of a crime has been encouraged to take a matter to the police? No, but then I don't know the opposite either. And do you know of any case where an elder has reported a crime that has been reported to him, to the police? No, I don't, and I don't know the opposite either. Sorry, I don't mean to answer them the wrong way. I'm just saying it's a hypothetical situation. I don't know. Those are my questions, John. Um, can we um, just look at um, document 77? Are you familiar with this document? Um, it would appear to be one of our articles in the magazines. Yes, you, you're familiar with it? I can't say that I'm very familiar with it. I'm sure I've read it in the past, but it's not as if I can remember the details, no. Yeah. Um, I mean, do we have a hard copy of it? seems to be a discussion of the trauma that a victim of incest might suffer. on page 30 it seems to be from the publication which will be the fifth page I think what's said to be a realistic view and the permanent solution, do you see that? Mm -hmm. Now the realistic view is said to be the way of helping the victim of emotional trauma do you see that? Mm -hmm. Um and it talks about um, biblical references and goes on to talk about the permanent solution in biblical terms. You see that? Yes. Now, I'd just like to know, um, well, first of all, um, people who suffer incest can, of course, suffer great trauma, can't they? Yes. Except, uh, now, this document seems to be totally focused upon a biblical response, not a medical, if you like, psychiatric or psychological response. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I understand. Is the doctrine that you're taught um, exclude or confine in any way the need for a person who suffers trauma to receive conventional help from qualified practitioners? Certainly not. That's a personal choice. We don't make a recommendation one way or the other, but sometimes it's pretty obvious that professional help is needed to help the person. All we can do is help the person spiritually. Um, BCB obviously needed professional help. She told me that she had been seeing professional help, yes. Um, and, um, of course, professional help costs money. You've got to pay them. Does the, your church accept any obligation to assist those who might have suffered at the hands of an elder in obtaining professional help? 
I wouldn't know the answer to that. Not that I've ever been involved in. I wouldn't. I can only speak from my experience. I've never been involved in any experience where the organisation has helped that way. But maybe they have. I wouldn't know. You think it should help? Well, that would be my personal opinion, and I don't think my personal opinion is particularly that worthwhile. Why not? I would talk from my limited experience and I don't think that that's appropriate. When I, when I do things, I try to research things and come up with some opinion that at least demonstrates some thought. But answering here at no notice, I think I'd just say what came into the top of my head and I don't think that would be appropriate. Have you been following the work of the Royal Commission? No, I haven't. Not at all? Not at all. When did you first know you would have to give evidence here? Mm, a few weeks ago. Oh, might be a couple of months ago, but it was a matter of weeks. The work of the Royal Commission has received publicity all over Australia. Yes. And you haven't read an article about it? Uh, to tell you the truth, I've scanned the headlines of the Saturday paper and I might have read a couple of paragraphs in and then moves on. And that's about it. What about the television news? I don't watch the news. What about the radio, the ABC? I don't listen to the radio that much. Yes. Does anyone else have any questions? No, Your Honour. No, Your Honour. No. no one? No, thank you. Very well, Mr Bellows, um, that ends your evidence, you're excused. Thank you. The next witness, Your Honour, will be BCG. BCG? Yes. necessary for you to be sworn. Will you take an oath on the Bible or an affirmation? I'm an affirmation. Affirmation. Would you repeat after me then? I do solemnly, sincerely and truly. I, sol I solemnly, sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission. That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Take a seat, please. <coughs> yes, Mr. Sir. Thank you, Honourable. PCG's names and address are known to the Royal Commission. And PCG's supported by her partner. Do you have a copy before you of your statement dated 10 July 2015? Yes. I understand that there is a correction you wish um, to make in that statement. It's on page 5 at paragraph 20. Yes. Um, I would... Oh, sorry. I'll identify it. I was just waiting for it to come up on the screen. you wish to know? <clears throat> Actually, with that last sentence, could I delete it up to the comma? So, just the words, I was allowed to see a worldly doctor about my depression, and then also the word butter, I take it? Yes, that's correct. And so, it would remain, I was forbidden from speaking about the church, as it would bring reproach on Jehovah's name. That's to remain, is that, that right? Yes, that's true, yes. Right, subject to that correction, do you 
Otherwise, okay. confirm your statement as being true and correct. Okay. I tell you the statement. It will be Exhibit 29.6. I'd ask you to read your statement commencing at paragraph 3. Can I, can I just understand the change you've made to paragraph 20? Um, by taking those words out, it doesn't, you know, this last sentence doesn't quite make sense. Your Honour, it's just that um, it, appear, it may appear that I saw a doctor about my depression whilst being a teenager and I didn't. It just may read that way, that's all. But, right. Um, yes, all right. It just, it just could have that kind of effect, and I didn't want to imply that. Yeah, all right. So your evidence is you were allowed to see a doctor, but that yeah. was only actually... <clears throat> I was allowed to see a doctor, but it implies that I saw a doctor during my teenage years, and I didn't. But you would have been allowed to see a doctor if you oh, had wanted to? I, ha I didn't actually... Well... You don't know? I don't know. Never did okay. it. <clears throat> Thank you. I was born BCG in Brisbane, Queensland, redacted, 1971. My full name is now BCG, a name my children chose for me. I had previously been known as BCG and BCG. Having taken, having taken the surnames of my partners at the time, I am 43 years old and have four children, the oldest of whom is 23 years old. I am currently in my final year of a law degree and I also work in the hairdressing and beauty industry. I was formally baptised as a Jehovah's Witness when I was about 16. My father is BCH, sometimes called BCH, and my mother is BCI. Together, my mother and father had seven children, of whom I was the second eldest. I have an older sister, who is two years older than me, and I also have three younger brothers and two younger sisters, redacted. I don't know exactly when my parents became Jehovah's Witnesses, but I think my father joined a congregation in St George, Queensland, when I was very young. My mother joined the same Jehovah's Witness congregation a short time after my father. My father initially worked as a redacted and later worked as an redacted. My mother stayed at home to look after the children. When I was about 10 years old, my family moved to redacted north, Queens, north of Mareeba in Queensland my parents joined the Mariba Jehovah's Witness congregation. My father was a very strict and highly regarded Jehovah's Witness. When I was about 13, he was appointed as a ministerial servant at the Mariba congregation. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that when a man is appointed as an elder or a ministerial servant, he is appointed by God's that means Jehovah's, often referred to as Jehovah's Holy Spirit, to judge others. My father took his role as a ministerial servant very seriously. He used to quote the scriptures constantly, both at the congregation's kingdom hall and at home. He regularly delivered talks from an elevated platform at the Jehovah's Witnesses meetings at the kingdom hall. My father was also given special responsibilities by the congregation elders, including conducting private Bible studies with other congregation members, managing groups of Jehovah's Witnesses for field service, that's door-to-door -door preaching, and teaching and counselling the congregation. When I was a child, my father made me and my siblings attend the meetings at the Kingdom Hall at least three times a week. There was a two-hour meeting every Sunday, another two-hour meeting on a Friday, and usually a one-hour meeting midweek. The meetings involved elders and ministerial servants teaching and counselling the congregation about keeping the congregation clean and righteous. 
In order to prepare for the meetings, my brothers and sisters and I had to study the Bible and read the daily scriptures. During the meetings, my father would pressure me and my siblings to offer answers to questions posed by the elders and ministerial servants leading the meetings. He would also make me deliver scriptural talks before the congregation from the platform in the Kingdom Hall and take part in field service. In the Jehovah's Witness Church, men are at the top of the hierarchy and hold all the authority next to Jehovah. Man is the head of the house and his wife and children have to obey him and refrain from questioning his authority. Adult females are next in line, and then children are at the bottom of the hierarchy. There were many rules to comply with and things that I had to do in order to be a good Jehovah's Witness. As the head of the household, my father was the person who dictated and enforced compliance with the rules in our house. He was also answerable to the elders in the congregation and I think he was therefore really keen to impress the elders and show how obedient his family was. In our house, for example, we were only allowed to watch certain television programs and listen to certain radio programs. We were not allowed to read anything other than Jehovah's Witness material. As a child growing up in a strict Jehovah's Witness family, the church and my father dictated who I was and wasn't allowed to associate with. I certainly wasn't allowed to associate with anybody outside the Jehovah's Witness community, other than the children at school that I, the, at the school I attended. Even when I was at school, um, the Jehovah's Witness church decided which lessons I could and couldn't attend. For example, I wasn't allowed to attend sex education lessons at school as the Jehovah's Witness counselled that it was the responsibility of the Jehovah's Witness parents to teach their children about sex. My father also never allowed me to attend any form of extracurricular activity, for example sports, because the church advised against it. In the late 1980s, school attendance in years 11 and 12 was not compulsory. My parents didn't allow me to stay at school after year 10 because choosing higher education over Jehovah was frowned upon by the church. Even after I finished school in year 10, I wasn't allowed to pursue full-time work because I needed time to dedicate to preaching. My father used to tell me that I was headstrong and that I needed more training to be obedient. But it didn't matter how hard I tried, I was never good enough. He used to tell people in the congregation and my family that I was a troublemaker. To the congregation, he appeared righteous and spiritual, but at home my father had a very short fuse and become violent and abusive. He used to beat me frequently often using a black leather strap that left welts on my skin. Out of my siblings, I was the one that bore the brunt of his aggression. As a Jehovah's Witness, I was taught to love and fear Jehovah and to respect my father and to be obedient to my parents. I was taught never to question my parents or their decisions. My father always threatened to kick me out and to treat me as though I was disfellowshipped if I ever disobeyed him. A person would be disfellowshipped if they had sinned and did not adhere to the counsel given by the elders in a committee meeting. Disfellowship means excommunicated from the church and nobody, family, friends included, would be allowed to associate or talk to you until you're reinstated. The fellowship people are ostracised and actively avoided by members of the congregation. I was always terrified of being kicked out of home or disfellowshipped 
because I feared what Jehovah would do to me. I was taught from a young age that people outside the church, which are referred to by the Jehovah's Witnesses as worldly people, were bad and not to be trusted, as they served Satan. Even the prospect of speaking to the police was extremely scary, as they were also considered to be very bad people. I felt enormous pressure from the church and from my father to be a perfect, obedient child. By the time I was in my early to mid-teens, I felt isol very isolated and alone. I became quite depressed and at times suicidal. I was forbidden from speaking about the church as it would bring reproach on Jehovah's name. By the time I was about 16, I was determined to leave home for many reasons, including that I wanted to escape Jehovah's Witnesses without being disfellowshipped. I wanted to do it on my own terms. By this I, would, I mean that I wanted to fade away from the church and become inactive while retaining my faith as this course was less likely to result in punishment from Jehovah. It is hard to explain, but I didn't want to be shunned by the only people that I knew as well as live in fear of Jehovah. I think my father abused me when I was about five years old. I don't remember anything specific from that time, but I do recall feeling extremely uncomfortable and scared when my father put a nappy on me at night before bed. That memory made a lot more sense to me once I discovered what my father did to my sisters at a similar age. When I was in Year 7, I recall my father asking me and my older sister to give him a kiss. It was a real sloppy kiss on the lips, and I remember thinking that it wasn't right. I didn't like it at all. My father used to tell me, I was sexy, and sometimes he would say to me, you have it, but your sister doesn't. My father often removed my bedroom door because I would either shut it to get dressed or lock it to keep him out. I don't remember any other clear instances of feeling so uncomfortable until, again, until I was 17. I suspect that I may have blocked a few things out. In October of 1988, my mother took my siblings to Expo to see, I'm oh sorry, Brisbane to see Expo 88. They were away for about two weeks. I had just turned 17 years old and I wanted to save money to buy a car. So I stayed at home with my father. Although my father beat me a lot, he could also treat me like a normal person. I wanted him to be proud of me to accept me and to recognise that I wasn't bad or evil. I thought it would be a good idea to stay home, at home with him and cook for him whilst my mother was away. I didn't think anything of staying at home alone with him because he was my father. While my mother and siblings were away at Expo, my father sexually assaulted me on a number of occasions. The first time that he tried to have sex with me, he came naked into my bed at night whilst I was sleeping and touched me all over my body. When I protested, I remember him saying to me, shh, it's okay, I'm your father. Be obedient to your father. I couldn't believe what was happening. After the first time, I tried to lock my bedroom door, but this made him so angry. While my mother was away, my father touched me and tried to have sex with me on at least four or five different occasions. I resisted as much as I could each time, but he was a violent man and prone to snap. I was absolutely petrified of him and tried not to make him angry. 
While my father sexually assaulted me, he quoted Bible scriptures and referred to the scriptures about being more obedient, that he made me put up on my bed, more obedient, that he made me put up my bedroom, bedroom wall. He said to me, while he sexually assaulted me, you have to be obedient to me. While my mother was away, my father also gave me alcohol and made me watch pornographic movies with him. After my father had touched me and tried to have sex with me, he behaved completely normal towards me, as if nothing happened. I convinced myself that it was all nightmares, but I always knew it was real. I used to pray to Jehovah to put his angels around my bed to stop my father from coming to me. But he didn't help me, and my father didn't stop. While my mother and siblings were away at Expo, my father took me on a motorbike to a Jehovah's Witness working bee in Cooktown. When we got home, my back was really sore from the motorbike ride, and my father told me he would massage my back for me. He started massaging my back, but moved down and started touching me where I didn't want him to. I told him I didn't want him to do that, but he said, shh, be quiet, I'm your father, be obedient. On the last occasion that I remember, my father sexually assaulting me while my mother and siblings were away in Brisbane. He started touching himself and tried to make me touch him as well. When I refused, he said to me with money in his hand, I'll give you $300 to help you with your car and 300 after if you bend over on the bed. I said to him, I don't want to do it and I don't need your money. My father became very angry with me and pushed me onto the bed. I managed to get away from him and ran outside. My father chased me through the backyard of our house, but I managed to escape to a neighbour's property. Once my, si once my mother and siblings returned from Expo 88, my father started to tell everyone that I was mental, a nutcase, and that I served the devil. He also continued to tell everyone I was a troublemaker. I think that because he was so respected in the congregation, the way he treated me was how everybody else in the congregation treated me, including my own mother, my family, and my family. My father also tightened his control over who I could talk to in the congregation, forbidding me to speak to anybody who he thought I might tell about the abuse. If I broke his rules, he flogged me. I knew that a, as a Jehovah's Witness, it was my duty to report any wrongdoing to the elders in the congregation. Although I wanted to tell them, I was terrified of doing so. So my father had threatened to beat me and kick me out of home if I ever spoke to anyone without him present. I'm sure that everyone in the congregation knew that my father was a violent man and beat me frequently. I was often forced to attend meetings, just having just been beaten by my father with his belt and still bleeding from the welts. On one occasion, after my mother returned from Expo 88, I remember my father wanted to get into the bathroom when I was in there. He couldn't get in because I locked, had locked the door, which I wasn't allowed to do. He bashed so violently on the door that it finally broke. And just before the door broke, I had managed to grab a towel to cover myself. And I was standing just behind the door. The door hit me in the face. Not long after that, I went to a meeting at the Kingdom Hall with a black eye. I remember one of the elders, Zinni Ally, that's Dino Ally's brother, 
asked me, what happened to your eye? I replied to him, my father kicked the bathroom door in my face. Then he just laughed in response and he, and he said, oh, did he? I felt that Zinni was dismissing what I had told him as though it was a joke. After my mother returned from Expo 88, the sexual abuse stopped, but my father kept knocking me around. He took the door to my bedroom off its hinges. There was no privacy or safety for me at home, not even the toilet, which had no lock or properly closing door. Some months after the sexual abuse had happened, while the rest of my family was away, I started to leave Watchtower magazines open around our house so that my father could see the articles on misconduct. I remember saying to him on one occasion, I know what you did to me and it's wrong. He said to me in reply, you're mental. My father left home some eight or nine months after October 1988. Before my father left, I tried to talk about the abuse to Lynn Bowditch, who was married to one of the elders in the congregation, Kevin Bowditch. Kevin was a friend of my father's who had helped build parts of our house. I said to Lynn, I need to talk to you about some stuff that's happened between me and Dad. Lynn spoke to Kevin and reported back to me. Kevin says he can't speak to you without your father present. I also tried speaking to another elder called Dino Ally. Dino was also a good friend of my father's. I remember calling Dino on one occasion from the pay phones near the post office in Mariba while on my lunch break from my part-time job. I remember sobbing and saying to Dino, I want to talk to you about things in my family that you don't know about, what my father is doing. Dino said to me, no, you have to talk to your father first or he must be present. I said to him, I can't do that. All I can remember after that is crying. I called Dino to try and talk to him about my father at least twice. In May or June of 1989, about eight months after my father sexually abused me, while the rest of my family was away, my father left my mother for another woman and had moved out of the family home. Once my father left, I found the courage to tell my friend, who later became my husband, BCJ, about the abuse. I told him that my father's been rude to me. BCJ's first response after this, after first response after I said this was, are you making this up to get back at your father for belting you all the time? And I said to BCJ, no, and if you don't believe me, then no one will. The next day, when I saw BCJ again, he told me that he had spoken to my father and he said to me, it all makes sense now. BCJ did not tell me everything that he and my father spoke about. I don't recall what BCJ said to me, but I do remember getting the impression that my father had admitted to BCJ that something had happened. After that, BCJ said to me, we need to go to the elders. At that time, BCJ and another friend of mine were probably the only people in the whole congregation who treated me nicely. Soon after, I told BCJ he arranged a meeting between us and Dino Ally at Dino, Dino's workplace. 
I remember saying to Dino Alloy, my father has been rude to me. He seemed incensed and said to me, you do know that this is a very serious allegation you're making? And I said to Dino, I know, and that's why I'm saying it. I assume that Dino then spoke to Kevin and to another elder called Rhonda Roy, because within the next couple of days, they wanted me to attend what I understood to be a committee meeting. I didn't tell my mother about what happened because she was an emotional wreck after my father had left. I remember meeting with elders, Dino, Ron and Kevin, by myself on a number of occasions for a couple of hours at a time. On one occasion, they brought my father into the room so I could tell him what I had told the elders. I cannot recall exactly how many times I had to meet with the elders. I didn't want to be there and I felt so uncomfortable. I had nobody to support me. I don't remember anyone really explaining the purpose of the committee meeting to me. But I understood at the time that the elders were investigating what I had alleged. At the first committee meeting, the elders sat me in a room at the Kingdom Hall and came in one at a time and asked me to tell them what happened. After that, they all came in together and asked me more questions. They repeated this process several times. I felt like I was being interrogated and that the elders were trying to find inconsistencies in my story to catch me out. Now, in hindsight, I understand that the elders were investigating whether or not I was a credible witness and if my allegations could have been truthful. Because the elders were all male and all were my father's friends, I was very reluctant to speak to them about what had happened. Unless they asked me a direct question, I didn't really offer the full detail of the sexual abuse. I never felt as though any of the elders believed me. In fact, they seemed incensed by what I was saying and took the allegations personally. They asked me questions like, did you enjoy it? And how did you react to that? At times, it felt as though they were getting off on what I was telling them. The elders told me that I had to tell my mother about my abuse. When I told her that my father had abused me, she asked, really, what did he do? I didn't want to tell my mother any detail. So I said to her, he's been rude to me. She said to me, he did that to your older sister when she was two. I was absolutely gutted and upset. I asked my mother, how could you have left us alone with him knowing what he had done to my sister? My mother said to me, I didn't think he would do it again because he had become a Jehovah's Witness. After my mother had told me what my father had done to my older sister, it occurred to me that I should check with my two younger sisters if he had done anything to them. Together, my mother and I spoke to my younger sisters. They were about five and seven or eight at the time, and both of them said to me, yes, Dad has been rude. I remember my younger sister saying the words to the effect of he put his penis between my legs when we were laying down in the lounge room watching TV. I remember my other younger sister saying words to the effect. He made me have a shower with him and he touched me and massaged my pee in the shower. 
My mother came with me to tell the elders about my younger sisters. I remember that Ronda Roy said to us, we don't want to talk to your sisters because they're too young to know what they're talking about. This response made me so upset because irrespective of their ages, my sisters were also victims too and the abuse should have been considered by the elders. At some point after I told the elders about my younger sisters, the elders told me that I had to meet with my father and put the allegations of sexual abuse to him. They sat me down at the opposite end of a table to which I was sitting. I was extremely terrified, but I was trying to be strong and brave. I kept thinking of my little sisters. I remember my hands shaking and my knees knocking together with fear. The elders asked me to tell my father what I had told them. My father became very angry and I remember him saying, I'll flog you, I'll hit you, just where do you get out of this room? The elders didn't stop him from saying all of those things. I remember that later in the meeting, my father said to me, you seduce me. I responded by saying to him, you're my father, you're big and fat, why would I want to seduce you? Then I confronted my father about my sisters. I said, you touched my little sisters. I suppose you are going to say that a four-year-old and a six-year-old seduced you as well? How could you do that? You always taught us not to lie and here you are sitting here lying. You're a hypocrite. My father got very angry and said to me, I'll kill you. He stood up and started to move towards me, but the elders stopped him. I felt very intimidated and anxious about the threats that he had made, and I didn't feel at all protected by the elders. The elders decided to disfellowship my father, but I remember that Ron Geroy came to visit me at home, and he said to me, we want to make it very clear that we are not disfellowshipping him for what he did to you, but for other loose conduct. I asked in reply, why? Ron said to me, well, we need to have two or more witnesses to the same event. And I said in reply, but what about my sisters? Though, Ron said to me, it has to be the same event. I was mortified and devastated. It felt so wrong that my father's abuse affected me so much and yet didn't even qualify as something wrong in the eyes of Jehovah's Witnesses who professed to be acting with the authority of Jehovah and the Holy Spirit, which is considered to be above Australian law. I felt betrayed by my mother because she didn't protect my sisters and me or warn us when she knew what my father was capable of. I consider her complicit in my abuse and in the abuse of my sisters. About a week after he was disfellowshipped, my father appealed the decision of the elders. In or around July 1989, I remember that an appeal committee was formed. Three elders from other congregations in the area Joe Morazis, Don Wilson and Jim Bennett sat on the appeal committee. Don Wilson was the father of my best friend at the time. The elders from the first committee, Kevin, Dino and Ron, also attended the appeal committee meetings. I was called back to appear alone before the appeal committee, although no one explained to me why. This time, my father was sat in the corner of a room and was not allowed to speak to me or threaten me. The appeal committee elders asked me questions and I had to say everything all over again. 
This time, they were not accusing as the elders in the original committee meeting. Towards the end of the appeal committee meeting, I remember that Kevin Bowditch said to the room, can BCH confirm what he did to BCG for her sake? My father said the words to the effect, yes, I stepped out of line. At that time, I understood that in saying this, my father was admitting to have sexually abusing me. At some point, not long after the appeal committee finished their meeting, one of the elders came and told me that my father's disfellowshipping had been upheld. I don't remember which elder spoke to me or exactly what he said. After his appeal was rejected, my father moved away from Mariba to live in Cairns. Before he left, he used to stalk me and tamper with my mail by opening it and adding handwritten notes, which I tore up and never read. I remember telling Kevin Bowditch about what my father was doing and it was very intimidating. At one point, I moved out of home to stay with another Jehovah's Witness couple to try and escape my father's stalking and intimidation, but he still managed to find me. I'm aware that my mother told a lot of people in the congregation about what my father had done to me. After he was disfellowshipped, many people said things to me. I don't believe this happened, and I think you lied. I felt worthless, helpless, and embarrassed. I continued to live in Mariba and remained a member of Jehovah's Witnesses, Mariba Congregation. In November 1989, I married BCJ, and not long after I married BCJ, I still felt worthless and alone, and I tried to commit suicide by taking an overdose. I had to report my suicide attempt to the elders as it was a sin against Jehovah. I remember that I spoke to Rhonda Roy about it and I was chastised because attempting suicide is viewed as a serious wrongdoing in the church. A few years later, I can't exactly, I can't recall exactly when Rhonda Roy came to tell me that my father was going to be reinstated. Nobody had ever asked me if my father had apologised to me. So I said to Ron, why are you letting him be reinstated? And Ron replied to me, there comes a time when we can't hold him back anymore. He's doing all the right things. I asked Ron, what right things? Ron replied, he's attending meetings. And I said to Ron, how can you say that? He was attending all of the meetings and giving talks from the platform while he was touching all of his four daughters. He's been tampering with my mail, he's been stalking me, and he's not sorry. Ron said to me, we can't judge that. After Ron DeRoy told me about my father's reinstatement, I said to Ron, well, I want to take it to the police because the congregation is not safe and children are at risk. Ron replied to me, he is now a brother again, and he quoted the scripture that says that we don't take our brothers to court. Ron said to me, so if you take it to the police, you will bring reproach on Jehovah's name, and you can be disfellowshipped for doing that. I was very upset and disappointed. It seemed that there was to be no justice or acknowledgement for what my father had done to my sisters and me. I felt like we didn't matter and that the abuse was not considered bad enough in the eyes of Jehovah. Once again, I felt helpless because I feared Jehovah and I feared being disfellowshipped. My life would be worse than it already was. In or around November 1992, my father returned to Mariba 
to be reinstated. I remember that when it was announced to the congregation, all of the brothers crowded around my father, shaking his hand and patting him on the back. And despite many people in the congregation knowing what he had done to me and my sisters, I heard members of the congregation say, Welcome back, BCH, and congratulations, BCH, it's good to see you. I was petrified to be so close to my father, but I stood my ground and refused to acknowledge him. On the 19th of December, 1995, I wrote a letter to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society about the reinstatement of my father. In my letter, I described what he had done and the way in which the elders had responded to my allegations. The letter is at QLD.0068.0. Double zero one dot one four one zero. In response, I received a letter from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, dated twenty sixth of February nineteen ninety six, which said that the Watchtower would look into the points of concern that I raised in my letter. The letter also counselled faith in Jehovah. That letter is at QLD.0068.0019.1414. I did not believe that the Watchtower would or could do anything, and I considered the letter to be a token gesture only. I had already put my faith in Jehovah and prayed to him to protect me from the abuse when it was happening, and he didn't. I had already put my faith in the elders when I reported the abuse to them, and they didn't protect me or support me either. I felt angry, upset, and let down, and I began to feel suicidal again because I felt as though there was no way out for me. In or around 1998 or 1999, my then husband, BCJ, and I moved to Townsville with our two sons. Not long after, I had my third son in Townsville. BCJ and I separated and I left the Jehovah's Witness Church. I couldn't stand the hypocrisy anymore and I was finding it hard to believe that elders and ministerial servants were really appointed by the Holy Spirit. Once I left the church, my three children and I were completely shunned, ostracised and actively avoided by members of the Townsville Jehovah's Witness congregation. The very first thing I did after I left the church was called the police. I was initially scared of the police because I had grown up being taught that everyone outside Jehovah's Witnesses church was to be feared. But the officer in charge of my case, Natalie Bennett, had an awesome manner and she was very supportive. Throughout the court cases, my only support was from the police and a support person assigned by the court. I gave a statement to the police in or about September 2000. In my statement, I limited what I said to the police about my interactions with the elders. I didn't include in my statement that I had tried to speak to Dino Ally and Kevin Bowditch whilst my father was still at home and I didn't go into detail at the committee meetings. When I made that statement to the police, I had only just left the Jehovah's Witness Church and was still very fearful 
that if I said too much about the elders at Mariba Congregation, I would bring reproach upon Jehovah's name. I was still scared of making Jehovah angry and suffering punishment from him. I didn't immediately give my letter to the Watchtower of December 1995 to the police for the same reason. <clears throat> At my trial, It's got a little way to go. I'm not sure what point you're on. Would you like to break now or do yeah, you want to keep could, going? Could I have a, a little break? Well, we can have the luncheon break now if you'd like and come back at 2 o'clock. Is mm -hmm. it? That's fine. That's suitable? Yes, thank you. Okay, well, we'll take the agenda. Awesome. <clears throat>